and a warm welcome to the Dean, Professor San Yenang, attendees of today's masterclass, and those joining us via the Zoom webinar. Before we begin, there are some housekeeping announcements. Please adhere to the safe management measures and maintain a safe distance of one meter apart. Sit in the designated seats here in the LT, and please keep your mask on throughout the session. In the event of an emergency, please follow the direction of the ushers, which are those in blue, which are Anna and myself, and evacuate in an orderly manner. We also kindly remind everyone to please put your phone to silent mode. At the end of the masterclass, please exit the lecture theatre using the door on your left or the right of the screen over here. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the masterclass and feel free to send in your questions via the QR code or the link which is pollev.com QNALT26. I repeat, QNALT26. And for those joining us via the webinar, in the event that the Zoom disconnects, please rejoin us at the same link. Conducting the masterclass of the day titled What Are My Options is Prof. Assistant Prof. Marco Weber from the Department of Mathematics. His research focuses on portfolio optimization with market frictions, systemic risk, and general equilibrium models. In this talk, Prof. Weber will provide an overview of stock options and a major part of financial markets and the maths behind them. But before we welcome him, let's have a quick look of a short video that was prepared by the department. Okay. Quantitative finance major. Hashtag quant. Is your goal a career in finance? To help clients maximize wealth and manage risks? To be future cons, we learn how to manage financial products, how to price, hedge, trade, and how to create new ones in a fast-growing, fast-changing industry. Quantitative finance is a multidisciplinary program integrating computing, finance, and maths. I learned to appreciate the maths behind finance. When I was on internship with a bank, I used the software to price financial products and also apply theories to deconstruct the pricing. Quantitative finance is a practice-oriented program with many career options. You are finance in banks and in tech companies and in organizations with complex data to model and analyze. We work in an exciting and fast-changing environment. I get to apply mathematical and statistical methods to make precise decisions to areas like trading and investment. So if the world of finance beckons, if your ambition is to be a financial whiz, start here. And that's the video shared by the department. So let's give a warm welcome to Prof. Weber for his presentation. Okay. Thank you. Hey, welcome uh, to this masterclass. So I'm uh, well, Marco Weber. I'm uh, one of the lecturers in quantitative finance. So uh, if you ever decide to actually enroll, you will see much more of me in the future. So the, as uh, um, you were just told, my presentation today is going to be about uh, options. So you very frequently hear about options in the news, but what are actually options? Why do people trade them? And uh, what, is, what, what is the meaning behind the price of an option? So if you actually want to find a fair price of an option, how would you go about that? Let me just move this. Uh, okay. These are just some uh, titles that I've uh, screenshotted from uh, some recent news, just to show that options appear very frequently in the news. Uh, Meta, just uh, to remind you, is uh, how Facebook brands itself nowadays. But options are a little bit everywhere in the world of finance. And even more so in um, recent years. For example, if you look at this graph, uh, this here shows basically the relation between trading in stocks and trading in options. 
So usually you think of options as something more complicated than stocks. So stocks are somehow the building block and options are just something that you create on top of it. So you can think of stocks or any types of assets is the stone and then the option is the sculpture somehow, something that derives from it. And usually when it comes to trading, traditionally people trade more in actual assets in stocks or something. And then option is kind of just something on the side. If you look here, as I said, this is basically the relation between how much is traded in options versus how much is traded in actual stocks. Okay, and until a few years ago, if, uh, if you had a certain amount of trading in stocks, then the amount of trading in options would be maybe like 20 or 30%. But actually recently, after the whole COVID mess, people started trading more options than actual stocks. Okay, which is uh, at least according to some measures. Okay, so options are a big part of uh, uh, financial markets, which begs the question, what, what are actually these options? So Dilbert doesn't have uh, a good answer. So when you buy options, what are you actually doing? You're basically giving some money to some banker or somebody, and what are they going to do with it? I mean, <laughs> probably buying Nike stuff. Uh, but if, if I don't really know what something is, the first thing that I do is always turn to Wikipedia, which is very reliable. This is what I've done here. So if you just open the page on Wikipedia on options, this is what the first paragraph says. Okay, so an option is a contract which gives to its owner, the holder, the right but not the obligation to buy or sell an underlying asset or instrument at a specified price on or before a specified date, depending on the style of the option. Okay, so there's quite a lot of information in, uh, in this uh, short paragraph, so I'm not expecting you to immediately have understood what this all means. Let's just break it down into smaller pieces. Okay, so what is an option? And specifically, I'm thinking of call options here, which are let's say the most important uh, type of option that has been uh, traded in the market. Okay, so first of all, an option is a contract. Okay, and whenever you have a contract, you have basically two parties agreeing on something. Okay, a contract is just an agreement. So you have two people, two parties, two companies. So typically for an option, you can think of one party being a company and another party being a bank. So in this example, the company would be the so-called buyer of the option and the bank would be the seller of the option. Okay, so the option is a contract. So it's basically a legal document. And in this contract, what it says, what it specifies are the following information, a type of asset. Let's assume I'm thinking of barrel of oil, but the type of asset can really be anything that can be traded, okay? It can be oil, it can be stocks, it can be gold, it can be really anything. I mean, magic cards, if you want anything at all that is an asset that you might want to trade. Okay. So let's say it's a barrel of oil. This is the first piece of information that you need. Then you need to set some future date. Let's say June, so three months from now. Let's say June the 5th. And then you have a certain strike price, okay? Just some fixed strike that you decide today, let's say $90. And now this is how the contract works. Today, the company just pays a certain amount of money to the bank, which is the price of the option, okay? Today, me as a company, I pay money to the bank. And in return, the bank guarantees that on June the 5th, I will be able, but not obliged, to buy one barrel of oil for $90. Okay, so this is where all the, the information comes together. In the future, June the 5th, I can buy a certain type of asset, the barrel of oil, for at most a, a pre-specified price, which is $90. Okay, so the way you can think of it is as a kind of insurance. Let's say in June, I want to buy oil, but I'm scared that the price of oil will go up. 
So I just ask the bank, can you sell me an insurance so that on June the 5th, I will pay at most $90. Okay, which means if the price of oil goes up by a lot, then the bank will somehow cover the difference, right? If the price of oil is going to be $200, the bank will pay, will cover the $110 difference between 200 and 90, and I will just pay $90. If the price of oil is lower than $90, then the bank is happy because they don't have to pay anything extra. I'm happy because the price is lower and nothing uh, more happens, okay? So let's maybe go a little bit more in the specifics of why anybody would want to trade or buy uh, an option like uh, what I just uh, described. Okay, so maybe you can picture yourself in the future. You've uh, attended uh, the open house at NUS and uh, you're very impressed by the initial video and by my very nice presentation. And you decide to enroll in, uh, uh, in the, in, at the maths department and major in quantitative finance. Okay, so now you're one of our students. And uh, well, now you're in the middle of the second term and well, towards uh, uh, the end of April and beginning of May, that's when the exams are going on. So you'll have to put on quite some effort, but if you study hard and you put in the effort, okay, you will get good grades. And one way, to maximize your effort is if you have maybe something to look forward to. And uh, one nice thing that I was thinking about because I've never been there myself is maybe you can uh, think of a vacation to Langkawi just later on after all the exams. So if you have that in mind, then maybe you will work really hard and then you will reward yourself with uh, a nice uh, vacation there. And as I said, I've never been there myself, so I've been monitoring a little bit uh, uh, flight prices. And yesterday, the one-way ticket to Langkawi is uh, still 72.4 Singapore dollars. So how does, uh, well, this is a uh, scoot. I, I'm sure that Singapore Airlines is a bit more expensive. Um, so how does uh, scoot choose such a price, okay? So the, the point is that, I mean, clearly depends on what the demand is for such, uh, such flights. But they also have some costs, right? And they need to make sure that they will make money at the end of the day. There are some costs that are very easy for them to calculate. So for example, I don't know how much uh, they are paying the cabin crew, how much they are paying the pilot, how much it costs to maintain the plane, how much uh, the airport fees are. These are all costs that they can already calculate. They have a very good idea on how much it will cost on June the 5th. But there are also some costs that are unknown to them. And the main one is fuel, okay? Because they are collecting all the, the money from the sales of the tickets today. Let's say everybody, uh, all of you decide to go all together to Langkawi. They're all uh, collecting the revenue today, but they don't know how much it will actually cost to fly the plane in June because fuel might become very expensive by then. And they are a little bit scared of that. If they're a serious business, they don't want to risk to lose money, right? So they have to take care about this unknown risk. And uh, if, you, if you actually look at how uh, the price of fuel changes over time, it is quite crazy. So the, the price of fuel depends on the price of oil, right? The more expensive oil is, the more expensive fuel is going to be. And if oil is cheap, fuel is going to be cheap as well. And if you just Google the price of uh, uh, a barrel of oil over time, it is quite crazy. So, for example, in December, the price of oil was uh, uh, $65. That's on the well, WTI market in, uh, in, uh, in America. Just uh, a couple of months later, in February, it was $90. Now it's actually above $110. So it changes quite significantly over time. And sometimes it also does a little bit some crazy stuff. Uh, so uh, for example, in April, 2020, the price of a barrel of oil was actually uh, quite negative. Uh, not even just a little bit negative, it was very negative. It was maybe like minus $40. Uh, maybe later, if there's a little bit of time I can go through. 
why such crazy thing, uh, uh, such crazy things uh, can happen. But as you see, the the price of oil is all over the place. I mean, sometimes it's like even extremely negative. Sometimes it's really high. So this is a, a serious uh, financial risk uh, for Scoot because in three months' time, you have no idea where the price of oil is going to be. If if it goes down, then Scoot is happy because the fuel price will be low. But if it goes up, that's going to be very expensive for them. So they go to a bank to ask them, please manage this risk for me. Because this is, as I said, it's, it's a serious risk. It's a serious financial risk for them. They don't want to lose money and then fly a plane that is super expensive to fly because the fuel is so expensive. Okay, so let's become a little bit more practical and think of what could happen in June. Okay, so let's assume that now the price of a barrel of oil is $90, and then two things can happen into the future. With 50% probability, the price of oil goes up by a lot. So let's say it goes up to $150. And then with 50% probability, instead the price of oil goes down to 60%, sorry, to $60. Okay, so let's assume these two things can happen with 50% probability each, okay? Now, if the price of oil goes down, then Scoot is happy and it doesn't matter, but Scoot is scared that the price of oil might go up and that fuel will be very expensive. Okay, so they go to a bank, so they uh, pick up the phone, they call uh, a salesperson at uh, DBS and they ask them, could you please provide me an insurance so that I will not pay more than $90 for oil in June. Okay, this is what they want. They just don't want to pay too much. Okay, so they want to pay at most $90 for one barrel of oil in, uh, in June. Okay, so what, what is happening now? If uh, DBS sells them this insurance, what, what happens is that, okay, in uh, the first case, if the price of oil goes up, then basically, DBS will cover the difference between $90 and $150. So Scoot will be able to buy a barrel of oil for $90. The actual market price is $150, and the difference will be covered by the bank, so $60. Instead, in the second scenario, when the price of oil goes down, well, then it doesn't matter. The contract is useless because... Uh, that's the, let's say, the good scenario. So you don't need the insurance in this case. The oil is cheap, so Scoot just buys it on the market for $60, right? This is, uh, when I said that, uh, because what it is, it's an option, right? So Scoot has the option to buy for $90, but if it's cheaper in the market, they will just buy it on the market for 60 okay? So in this case, this option is worthless because anyhow, it's cheaper in the market, okay? So if you think of it from, DBS point of view, for DBS, they have to pay, they have to spend $60 if the oil price goes up with probability 50%, and they have to pay nothing when the oil price goes down, probability 50%. Okay, now the question is, if you're a DBS salesman, how much are you going to charge Scoot for this insurance? Right, Scoot is today. Is Scoot is calling the salesperson at DBS and ask me, ask him, please sell me this option, this insurance. Uh, what is the price for this? So, maybe uh, think a bit. Uh, what do you think uh, DBS should charge Scoot for such a product, such an option? Okay, and. Uh, well, I guess the most natural answer would be $30, right? It's the, the value of this insurance is $60 with probability 50% and zero with probability 50%. Okay, so you average it out and you would think, well, it probably a fair price for this option is $30. But if you thought that, well, then uh, you're, first of all, you're wrong and then uh, well, then you see that there is value in what we teach here. 
Okay, because I, I can show you that there is a different way to do it. And uh, actually the fair price that DBS should charge is $20, okay? And this is not intuitive at all, which is why we need quantitative finance, right? Because certain things are not as easy as they might look at first. Okay, so the actual price of this option is $20, okay? And the next step is to show why that is the case. Okay, so this is the Metze slide of the presentation. This is how the thing works. Okay, so let's assume DBS charges $20, okay? So DBS charges $20 to Scoot, they collect $20, then DBS is a bank, so arguably they're quite rich, they have a lot of money stored around there, so they just uh, open the safe somewhere and they take $40 out of the safe. So now they have $60 on the table, 20 that they just got from Scoot, and then 40 that they just said lying around there. And what they decide to do is they will buy two thirds of a barrel of oil today. Okay, I remind you that today the price of oil is $90. Okay, so if you have $60 there, you can buy two thirds of a barrel of oil. Okay, now let's uh, look at what will happen on uh, June the 5th. Okay. So DBS today takes the $20, picks $40 from somewhere, buys two thirds of a barrel of oil. Then they wait till June. And now it's June. And now you know what has happened. Okay, so there are two cases, right? In the first case, the price of oil went up. Okay. Now, DBS has promised that they will give Scoot one barrel of oil for $90, right? So they already have two thirds of a barrel of oil because they bought it earlier. So the only thing that they still have to buy is one additional third of a barrel of oil, which unfortunately now is quite expensive, but I mean, that's life. So before they spend $60 for uh, two thirds of a barrel of oil, and well, now the price is 150. So one third of a barrel of oil is uh, $50, okay? So they buy this additional uh, third, then they give it to Scoot. The contract says that DBS gives to Scoot the barrel of oil for $90, okay? So you give the barrel of oil that you have now to Scoot and Scoot gives you $90 back, okay? Now you're a net $40, right? Because you spent $50 in the third, uh, in this little piece of uh, oil that you uh, bought at the end. Scoot gave you $90. So you have uh, $40 remaining. But if you remember, you actually also took $40 from the safe at the very beginning. So you also have to put them back, right? Okay. So you take this $40, you put them back in the safe. And well, then it's like nothing happened, right? Uh, DBS hasn't lost any money, hasn't made any money either, but it's net zero, right? They just took the $20 at the beginning from Scoot. Then, well, they took $40 out of the safe, then they put them back. But everybody's happy. Scoot got the, the barrel of oil and DBS uh, uh, didn't lose any money, but didn't make any money either. Now let's look at the, the second scenario. In the second scenario, the price of oil goes down. Okay, so the price of oil goes to $60. Now DBS doesn't have to give anything to Scoot. Because Scoot will just buy the oil on the market for $60. So the option is uh, worthless, okay? So DBS just has, well, the barrel of the, the oil that they already bought in March, just lying around there. Well, it just takes up some space. So they don't want to take to keep it anymore. So they just sell it away. And one barrel of oil is $60. They have two thirds of, uh, of oil. So they sell it, which means that they make $40. Uh, 
and uh, these thirty dollars they put them back uh, in the safe. Okay, so even in the second scenario, DBS doesn't make any money, doesn't lose any money either, right? It's exactly they just borrowed. They took forty dollars out of the safe at the beginning. Now they sell the oil that they bought with that and put the, these forty dollars back in the safe. Okay, so you see that with these initial twenty dollars they received from Scoot, they can uh, promise this insurance without ever losing or making any money. And this is exactly how the option market uh, works here. And regardless of what happens, regardless whether the price of oil goes up or down. And by the way, the, the, the likelihood that it goes up or down doesn't even matter. Like I could have told you it goes up with probability 90% and down with probability 10%. This whole argument would have uh, been valid still. Okay, so regardless of what happens, DBS never loses money and never makes money either, right? They just take $40 from the safe at the beginning. And then in June, they just find those $40 again and put them back in the safe. Okay, which means that for DBS, there is absolutely no risk here. What this also mean is that, well, if they charge $20, then they don't make any profit. They don't make money. They don't lose money. They probably want to pay the traders because they uh, spend a lot of time at university studying quantitative finance, so they deserve to get paid well. So DBS will charge a little bit more than $20 just uh, to pay all of their employees and to profit a little bit. But they don't have to charge $30. They just need to charge a little bit more. And then whatever is above $20, that's just pure profit for them, right? Because there is no risk at all for DBS in this uh, uh, situation, okay? And on the other hand, Scoot is happy because they know for sure that they will never pay more than $90 in June for a barrel of oil. Okay. So this is a sketch of, uh, of how it works. Then obviously, this is maybe a more idealistic view of how, of why people trade options, right? This is sort of like the nice uh, sugar-coated uh, uh, description where People buy options because they are really concerned about risk. And this is how options started. Okay. Businesses were concerned about risk. And this is where options, which are some sort of insurance, come into place because they help companies to manage this risk. This is what this example was, right? Scoot, uh, DBS was helping Scoot to manage the risk from high oil prices. But options are also used for speculation and uh, now more than ever. So let's see how that works. Okay, so think of uh, the same scenario as before, right? You have banks, uh, or not just banks, financial entities selling options. And uh, let's say you're just an investor, you uh, got your first salary, and now you have a little bit of money to invest. So let's say you have $100 to invest. And let's say you have a very specific view of what will happen in the future. Let's say you are absolutely sure that oil prices will go up because, uh, I don't know, everybody wants to travel again, everybody will fly again, and therefore there will be a lot of need for oil and the oil prices will just go up by a lot. Okay, so you want to invest in oil. You want to somehow uh, bet on the fact that oil prices will go up. So there are different things that you could do. Well, the more standard thing is you just buy oil, okay? You, you buy oil and then you wait a little bit and then if oil prices go up, then you just sell it again. And that would be like the more standard investment. So if you have $100 of oil and the oil price actually goes up from 90 to 150, well, then your investment will go up from 100 to 167. Okay, and you make uh, $67 in profit. What if you buy options instead of the oil itself? Well, as I said earlier, the price of that one option that I described earlier is $20. 
okay, for one option. So you have $100 available. So you have enough money to buy five options. And this is what you do. So you buy five of these call options. How much are they worth in June if oil price actually goes up? They're going to be worth a lot because if the oil price goes up, each of them is worth $60, right? This is this, that insurance policy, right? The, the bank basically pays you the difference between 90 and 150. So for each of these options, it's going to be worth $60. You bought five of them. So they're going to be worth $300. That's a lot more than 167. So if you just buy oil with that money, you make uh, uh, $67. If you buy the call options, you make $200 in profits. But, uh, well, unless uh, you can really look into the future, usually people can be wrong. And many times they are wrong. So what, what happens? You should also consider the worst case scenario. Well, what happens if instead the oil price goes down? Okay, so somehow you are wrong. And, uh, well, people don't start flying again. Oil prices drop. What happens then? If the oil price goes down to $60 and you just bought oil, well, okay, that's too bad, but you lose a little bit of money, but it's not the end of the world, right? So if oil prices go six, down to $60 and you have invested 100, well, that means that your investment goes down to $67. So you lost $33. Okay, you lost a third, which hurts, but I mean, there is worse in life. But if you bought the five call options instead and the oil price goes down, they're all worthless, which means that you lose absolutely everything. Okay. Which this is just to say why options are used for speculation, right? You can make a lot of money, but you can also lose a lot of money. But this is also why they are, some, they are popular with uh, some people because they're very risky. And this is only if you buy options, if you actually sell option, options. So if you're like on the side, on the other side of the trade, where you're like DBS, where you're selling the option, then actually there is no limit to how much you could lose. You can potentially lose an infinite amount of money. So this is just as a reminder that uh, do, not trade, <laughs> do not trade options, or at least not uh, until you're really sure about uh, what they are. So, um, yeah, this is all for me. Maybe I have just a couple of minutes. Uh, uh, maybe I can just, uh, I mentioned this thing, this curiosity. So maybe I can just uh, explain a little bit uh, what this is about, why oil prices uh, collapsed and became uh, negative at some point. And this has a lot to do with speculation. Okay, because a lot of people, I mean, a lot of people buy oil because they need oil. But a lot of people just buy oil because they think that oil prices will go up. But in practice, it's not that you just go to a market and you give them $90 and they give you a barrel of oil because that's a little bit cumbersome. So what people do usually is they buy something called futures, which is another financial product, which is just a, a promise to buy oil in the future. Okay, this is why they're called futures. So instead of uh, buying actual oil, you say, I will buy oil for $90 in, well, that was April 2020, with the idea that, well, I don't want to actually receive the oil in April, but I will just sell it again right before they come and give it to me, right? Because I don't actually want the oil, right? I just want to speculate on the fact that oil prices will go up. But, uh, well, if uh, you can kind of guess uh, why it happened in April 2020, that was after COVID. So everything was in lockdown. Factories were not running anymore. Planes were not flying anymore. So nobody actually wanted oil anymore. So a lot of people maybe have bought futures before COVID. And now they're trying to sell them again. Because if they don't sell them, somebody will just come with a van with all this oil in April 
And obviously, if you're like a rich banker, you don't want somebody to come with a van in front of your condo and with all this oil. Okay, you don't know what to do with it. So people were getting so desperate that they were just selling it before the delivery date to avoid somebody coming with a van with all this oil. And this is why prices went negative. They were so desperate that they were willing to pay other people to actually buy it from them because they didn't want, because it was much worse to actually receive the oil rather than paying somebody to, to get rid of it. Okay, so this is just the, the little quirk uh, here. Um, so I'm done. If there are any questions. Thank you, Prof. Weaver, for guiding us through this masterclass. We will now be opening the floor to any questions. Please send in your questions by scanning the QR code, which will be on screen shortly, or on the poll EV link, which was QNALT26, once again. Or if there's anyone on the floor here who wishes to raise their hand and ask a question, please feel free to do so. Is there anyone? Maybe you can ask about a particular option that you've been looking at. I've, I'm not sure. Hey, there is a question from the web. What foundational math is required? I mean, uh, to enroll in, uh, um, in, in a bachelor uh, here with QF major. I don't think there is any maths. Uh, I mean, you'll just learn it here. For this option pricing, I mean, there is actually a lot of probability uh, involved in it. Uh, but anyhow, you will learn it uh, at NUS uh, uh, beforehand. I don't know if Victor. Uh... Uh, maybe I, I just add on. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm the deputy head of the Department of Mathematics. Uh, so quantitative finance program is a, a program offered by the Department of Mathematics. I, I believe many of you understand that. So that the main difference between the finance that you may go to business school and the finance that you take from mathematics department is very different, right? Our focus is really on the mathematics part of it. So somebody just now asked, uh, what are the maths? Actually, in your first two years, we are building your foundation. You'll be taking uh, the standard um, foundation courses like calculus, linear algebra, probabilities. So just now in uh, Professor uh, Weber's um, example, you also see that there are some you know, um, probability involved, right? So, so you need to also have some good foundation in all these um, area of mathematics. Yeah, how do you choose QF? Uh, when you apply for university admission, what you do is you just choose Humanity and Science, CHS, okay? It's only if uh, NUS accepted you into Humanities and Science, then you declare your major as quantitative finance if you're interested, okay? Does it work? Yeah, maybe I can just uh, uh, answer to the third question. Uh, well, that is just because it doesn't work if they buy any other amount. So obviously you need to go through the maths to understand that it's exactly two thirds and how you get to two thirds. Well, that's a little bit more complicated and it will be covered in, uh, in the actual course, but it, it just doesn't work. If, if you try with one half and three quarters, you will see that uh, there is a risk for DBS to lose money. So only if they buy two thirds, they will for sure not lose any money. Okay. How big is the QF cohort? Um, so um, last year is the first year that we started this uh, revamp CHS. So the QF program is also revamped and taking it as a primary major, we have about 50 students. Yeah, but there are also many other students taking QF as second major. Yeah, so it's very hard to quantify yeah, because students can declare second majors later on. Yeah, so uh, roughly 50-ish is the, uh, the students who really want it as a primary major. Okay. Um, Rob, I, I, I just answer that question, why people study train a lot more options after COVID. Mm -hmm. And uh, this has a lot to do with uh, how things were working uh, in the US. 
So first of all, people were not working anymore and they were still having some money because the government was just sending them checks uh, at home as welfare. And at the same time, uh, it was just maybe uh, a coincidence that uh, uh, a certain trading app became very popular in the US, Robinhood. And it was just a way to trade. Uh, it was kind of like the Facebook of trading. Like it was very much like a game. So people just started trading out of boredom and because they had this extra money from the government and it was uh, allowing them to trade also options. You, traditionally, trading options is much more complicated and you have to go through a broker. But with this app, everybody was able to trade options. So everybody started just doing it uh, because of this app uh, and because they had the yeah, welfare checks. Well, uh, career prospect for quantitative finance over the past few years actually is uh, very good, right? So among the um, faculty of science, so many majors, quantitative finance students or graduates uh, always uh, have the highest uh, employment rate and also among the highest in terms of their starting salary, okay? Yeah, so mainly they will be going to all this uh, financial industry, like banks uh, or, or investment company and so on and so forth, okay? Uh, the cutoff for QF, no specific cutoff for uh, the, the IGP uh, is, uh, is the same for all the humanities and science. So that means the students just need to compete against any other students who want to humanities and science, okay? Once you are in, then you are free to choose uh, math or quantitative finance or physics is up to you. Okay, but of course, if you want to do quantitative finance, we will advise students to have good grades in their maths or for the maths. Okay. How much do they usually earn after a few years? Uh, well, of course, uh, the median is. Uh, in the past few years, it can be like 3,000 over or to, to even 4,000 over. That's the starting pay. Yeah. We, we only do surveys when students, when, when the graduates are just graduated a few months, right? Subsequently, we don't really track. So I can't really answer for sure after a few years, but good prospect. Huh? Male-female ratio in, in QF. I think it's quite balanced. Yeah. Uh, that's different. Does it switch career path into teaching? Um, I will. Well, of course, uh, uh, teaching it really depends on the criteria and se selection criteria of MOE. Yeah, but uh, I would say that. Um, the, based on the modules that the students take, uh, it is, okay, put it in a way, quantitative finance is also like uh, specialization of mathematics in applied mathematics, yeah? So definitely MOE uh, for, for teaching careers, uh, MOE do take in uh, graduates who are applied mathematics focused. So, so I would say that uh, there's no reason why uh, they don't take in QF students, okay? Uh, so the easy question to answer, can I take a second major in QF? Yes. Uh, so for example, if you are first major in mathematics, you can do a second major in QF or, or there are many other combinations. Huh? Yeah. Okay, there, there was, a, I think, a question for me at the very beginning. Uh, how did you come out with the figures in scenario one, 150? Uh, so if, uh, well, this is a simplified example, obviously, but if, if I choose a different scenario, so if I say that the price goes up by 160, then it's just that then the same strategy would not work anymore. It just means that the bank will have to buy more oil at the beginning. So instead of two thirds, it will have to buy, I don't know, a little bit more uh, than that, maybe 80 percent, four fifths or something. So uh, the strategy will change, but you can change the strategy in order to still make it risk-free for the bank. It's just that the strategy will be a little bit different. Uh, 
graphing calculators. <laughs> okay, if you still have your graphing calculator, uh, I mean, just, just keep it long, but uh, I, I doubt that uh, you, it's more for A-level exam, I would say. Right? When you come to university, you'll be introduced to use all kinds of software. Uh, so so you, you, you'll be using your laptop more than the graphing calculators, I would say. Yes, you can take QF as a minor or second major. You can do that. I mentioned that. The difference between QF in math and QF in business. Uh, uh, Marco, you want to... Uh, students who are doing you know, finance in, in, in business school versus what we teach. You, you want to comment about that? As you said, uh, this is still within the math department, so it will be much more math focused. So the, the, also the career prospects will probably be more into sort of uh, quant positions uh, if you do uh, QF in maths. Also, I, I can say that like a lot of banks, they actually prefer people who studied maths or not necessarily maths, but more STEM uh, uh, kind of subjects rather than actual uh, uh, finance because they often understand better the, the models uh, that, that are involved. Uh, uh, so the career prospects are a little bit different, but uh, yeah, for certain quant position, like very technical positions, I think uh, maths background is uh, very valuable. Well, there are ample internship opportunities, right? So, so many of our QF students, you know, during summer, uh, long and short vacation, uh, they, it's, it's uh, quite easy for them to find uh, all this temporary work in the uh, finance industry. Can you take a second major if your primary major is another faculty? Yes, you can do that as well. Uh, to participate in the, you want to answer that? Uh, I mean, I mean uh, the, the, there are also courses on portfolio optimization. So it's not, uh, today I, will, uh, I talked about uh, option and option pricing, which is one subject of, uh, mm -hmm. um, Quantity finance, but investment and portfolio optimization, uh, that, that's also, uh, there are also modules uh, on, on that uh, that you can attend. Yeah. So the, the difference between QF major and mathematics is that in, for QF, we also introduce students many of the different kind of uh, uh, finance knowledge, right? So like today, you know something called options, you know, futures, and many, many others. So that will be, you know, specifically uh, be taught to QF students in one of the modules. Okay. Quickly, that would you <laughs> recommend people to do it? Okay. Uh, I don't want to give uh, actual investment uh, advice because otherwise somebody will sue me later. But I mean, options and crypto are both very risky. So uh, I would not recommend to do that. And uh, yeah. Yeah. How much time do we still have? Well, thank okay. you, guys. And thank you, Prof. And thank you, students, for submitting your questions. So uh, once again, thank you to Prof. Weber for answering our participants' questions. And if you have any other questions, you do feel free to send an email to the email address, which will be shown in a second. And we hope you had a great time learning about the course and glimpsing into your time at NUS. Do feel free to explore more at Experience NUS Open House around campus, including locations such as U-Town and others. We wish you a good day ahead and please exit the lecture theatre via the door on your left, which is over here. Thank you. Have a good day.